I'll start with water. Uh, thank you very much, to, uh, Richard. I know it's customary behaviour to make some uh, very sharp comments about the person of, uh, who is responsible for the founding of the series and one thing or another. I chaired the, or I was a member of the Carlisle Committee in Oxford for many years, and I was always impressed by people's ingenuity in saying something new about uh, the Carlisles, uh, most of which I have subsequently, of course, forgotten. Um, I planned, in fact, to leave my genuflection to uh, Max Weber to the end of the paper, uh, because by then it will be pretty obvious that it, you know, I'll have spent 50 minutes basically uh, genuflecting to him and paying homage to his ideas. But I thought I might start simply by quoting the first sentence of Politics as a Vocation, because it's particularly apt. The first sentence reads, the lecture which I am to give you at your request will necessarily disappoint you in various ways. <laughs> but I'll leave it open as to exactly which ways it's going to disappoint you. So uh, in book nine of Plato's Republic, Socrates asks Glaucon to imagine fashioning a multicolored beast with a ring of many heads that it can grow and change at will. He's then asked to fashion a lion and a human being and then to join the three of them into one and to cover it with the appearance of a single human being. Socrates' uh, image is intended to illustrate the benefits of justice over injustice, with it being appropriate to subordinate the beast-like parts of our nature to the human, or better, to the divine, and shameful to enslave the gentle to the savage. Although Socrates presents the image in a discussion of the individual injustice, as much of the rest of the text, there's also this intended parallel between, uh, with the state and the polis. It must be ordered by wisdom, it must contain and control the conflicting elements of the multicolored beast within it, and it must harmonize through reason and discipline the conflicting elements of which it's comprised so that all the elements in the state are ruled by the highest part. This image of the multicolored beast or the multi-headed beast is a common one within 19th century and indeed 18th century uh, depictions uh, of corruption. Um, uh, more heads there, I think, than, than anywhere else. Uh, and this, the hydra of corruption, is a consistent kind of theme. It's the existence of the idea of an ideal order that allows us to talk about a standard that is being corrupted. Corruption occurs on this view when the appropriate or natural standard for action in the public realm is subverted by people acting on motives and incentives which should be excluded from decision making by those in public or judicial office. In the Republic, the political world is the multicolored beast. The concern is not with the corruption of politics, but with the corruption of an ideal order by politics. Indeed, for the Plato of the Republic, political corruption seems to be a tautology. Now, over the last 30 years, political scientists and economists have in various ways replicated Plato's position. We don't often think of economists as Platonists, but the neoclassical variety share the view that the ideal order is distorted or corrupted by political agency. And they see the state and government regulation as corrupting the pure incentive model and creating opportunities for rents. Similarly, much republicanism conceives of the state as securing the common good and sees factionalism and the pursuit of private interests in the state as corrupting the attainment of that good. They thereby deny that politics is fundamentally concerned with deep conflicts of interest over which there's inevitably an ongoing struggle for power to establish, uh, never wholly, uh, to establish a never wholly consensual or stable settlement. One alternative to these approaches is to try to identify a set of standards that are internal to and operative in a particular domain or set of st institutions. That route raises three problems, whether there's an uncontentious account of what those standards might be, 
whether the criteria derived from that account predicate only and exactly the appropriate set of actions without excluding other actions that we see as corrupt or including actions we don't see as corrupt, and what it is that provides a common element that allows the term to be used intelligibly across a range of domains or institutions. If the Platonist account judges political corruption by a set of standards external to politics, this alternative account seems to offer only very unstable ground on which to build the normative judgments that many commentators associate with the use of the term corruption. Nonetheless, in this lecture, I will examine what an account, such an account of corruption within politics might look like. I acknowledge that the definition of corruption is inherently unstable, since standards of politics are contested and shifting, and particular definitions often fail to capture the range of intuitions about corruption in any particular context. Consequently, there's little prospect of full congruence between judgments across different domains or political orders. Moreover, struggles within politics are also struggles over the standards that should be applied. And these remain inherently polit political. They are part of the melee. They're not above the fray. And that means that we need to reflect on how we identify and categorize derelictions, and also about the effects that categorizing derelictions uh, have, and how far they support or undermine our political systems. Rather than treating the analysis of political corruption as a standard setting ex enterprise for politics, done externally, this paper argues we should see it as part of politics and that that means that, that a new range and a, a range of new and rather different considerations enter into the debates. And many people will find this a rather unappealing account uh, or approach to, uh, to doing this. And there are aspects about which I'm pretty uncomfortable. But the case I'm concerned to make is that there are th these un unappealing features are necessary consequences of taking a less Platonist, more realist approach, and that we have to take that approach if we're to take politics and its corruption seriously. Now, some of my thinking in this area has been in, uh, influenced by my involvement in a series of recent debates over realism in political theory. At the heart of what I take to be plausible versions of a realist critique of liberal thinking about politics is less a denial of the reality of values in the political sphere, though some people go for that line, more a recognition that while those values exist, they are always potentially in conflict. Fundamental conflicts between values means that any political ordering will involve trade-offs and will play down some areas of value while promoting others. Consequently, any particular ordering will be to some degree partial, and this will be true both for procedures, since they will involve uh, one particular reading of the right balance between fairness, equality, justice, rights of participation, and so on, and it will also be true for outcomes. These outcomes will, in consequence, command only limited legitimacy, and will be only more or less stable. Moreover, the ability to get solutions to stick and the claims on and use of resources needed to do so, financial, material, ideological, persuasive, and coercive, is a political and creative process that is inherently non-neutral in character. On this view, what Bernard Williams calls the basic legitimation demand will not be met equally for all except under conditions of such unanimity of commitment that we should doubt that politics and its attendant compromises are in fact necessary. All legitimation is conditional, partial, and potentially fragile, shored up, sometimes tightly consolidated, sometimes barely, by historical experience, traditions, habits, backed by systematic enforcement by coercive institutions. Legitimacy can have many sources and many degrees, but realists deny that there can be a free and open consensus as a foundation for politics, and they understand that political orders cannot long be sustained solely by such means, and that an irreducible element in politics is the laying claim to and the exercise of power, above all the power to impose solutions and to compel compliance. 
From the same position, there can be no unidimensional linear metric of power allowing systematic comparisons between states of affairs. How many are coerced, manipulated, or cowed? In what ways, to what extent, uh, involves judging across multiple dimensions of value, taking account of the conflicting commitments that generate the political problem of order that needs to be solved, and considering the way in which decisions are made, justified, and implemented. We can usually distinguish in rough terms between the very bad and the good, and we can occasionally recognize some Pareto improvements, but most judgments about A being better than B rely on giving priority to some goods, values, or ends over others, and those judgments cannot be wholly consensually and cannot be wholly consensual uh, and impartial. In politics understood in this way, political standards are forged politically. They're always potential open to, potentially open to challenge by some elements of the community. In society with liberal democratic traditions and procedures and accompanying political discourse of legitimation that emphasizes the rights of the citizen and responsibilities of those in power, precision in the characterization of those responsibilities for people in public office is an integral part of legitimation. And certain types of critique or challenge to such characterizations can have serious implications for the stability of the political order. Seeing political corruption from within politics means seeing criteria for corrupt acts as part of the self-policing of a particular system of rule. Such self-policing can be adjusted and reformed, but when approached with a political rhetoric that demands uncompromising adherence to foundational values, legitimacy can be deeply damaged. And where legitimacy is under threat, political rule will be experienced as more heavy-handed and may well become so. To be concerned with corruption in politics rather than by it means that we should recognize that our understanding of this phenomenon in the West is very closely tied to the compromises we have struck in the establishment of our political systems and that challenging that understanding is simultaneously to challenge those compromises. Now this lecture, uh, there's a longer, there's always a longer piece, isn't there? Um, I, I would talk a lot about administrative office because I think administrative office is interesting, but I'm going to actually move on and talk about two main components, two other main components of concern. One is with the definition of political corruption and the other is uh, with political office, which I think is much more rarely evaluated. So on most standard interpretations, corruption involves those in public office using it to serve their ends rather than the ends of the public. In modern Western bureaucratic systems, there's, a wide, there's widespread agreement that public officials are expected to set aside their private interests in undertaking their official commitments. This allows Bo Rothstein, for example, to emphasize the importance of impartiality um, as the principle at stake when political officials act corruptly. In accepting public office, the agent accepts that the role confers responsibilities that trump their private interests. This model of administrative public office is very widely held. Not all derelictions of duty are corrupt. Public servants can be, believe it or not, idle, incompetent, or prejudiced. Most definitions of corruption want to leave such cases aside and outside the definition of corruption while recognizing them as forms of malfeasance. Similarly, there's an issue about when a public official's behavior should be seen in, ter in terms of categories other than corruption. For example, theft, fraud, venality. For corruption to avoid becoming a catch-all category, which then seems to weaken its coherence and its normative force, we need a line between those kinds of infractions and corruption. So definition is important. Most standard definitions of corruption are not illuminating or convincing. So corruption involves the abuse of public office for private gain. It doesn't tell us what counts as an abuse. It encompasses many things like simple theft that seem distinct from corruption. It's overly restrictive in apply, implying that private institutions cannot include a corruption and in restricting gain to private gain when factional or party gain is often a major force for corruption. And the definition makes no mention of those who are trying illicitly 
to influence the way those in office behave, namely the corrupt Tories. David Beetham's recent, uh, recently proposed redefinition, distortion and subversion of the public realm in the service of private interests, seems similarly flawed. What counts as distortion or subversion might narrow down types of abuse, but it gives us no criteria by which to identify what these involved and no criteria for distinguishing this set of cases as cases of corruption. The public realm is much broader than public office and the definition presumes that it's a single coherent domain. But competing conceptions of public office and its ends make corruption a function of one's preferred conception of the public realm. And the service of private interest is really no better than the pursuit of private, private gain. I want to take the position, though, that no definition is watertight. Different elements jostle for attention and vary in relevance and intensity across contexts and time. My own, uh, which is the long, boring one, uh, which I won't repeat, pulls together aspects of both public office and private interest definitions, but those remain in tension since constructions of public office and its responsibilities often part company with conceptions of the public interest. The definition has the virtue that almost any case that meets all the conditions is a case of what most people would call corruption. But in many cases widely regarded as corrupt, uh, it, or many cases that are widely regarded as corrupt might meet only some of these conditions. The public may benefit incidentally to a lesser extent. The public official may be responding to threats, not incentives. Benefit may be one that the corrupter couldn't have won in an open, could have won in an open public tender. The definition is also hard to apply in cases of corruption relating to party funding, when no public official may be involved. And the short answer is, I think no one condition is necessary. Different combinations of conditions that fall short of, uh, uh, of all of those might nonetheless prove to be sufficient. So some commentators have sought to impose more unity and coherence on the field by identifying a core component that is taken to be at the heart of corruption. So Bo Rothstein appeals to impartiality and makes an attractive and plausible but hardly uncriticizable case for its importance in administrative office. Lord, Laura Underkuffler um, takes a still bolder step and argues that what holds descriptions of corruption together is the view that corruption is fundamentally concerned with character and not just with conduct, and that we should understand the claim as one that describes an individual's deepest character. It is, she says, the capture by evil of one's soul. This view is unapologetically haunted by fears of inappropriate motives, demanding that people do the right thing for the right reasons, even though we've very little reason for thinking that people in public office uh, have wholly unalloyed motives. On her view, and I quote, she says, there must be an alternative moral and ethical system which is aggressively advocated and which is eventually regarded by officials and citizens as in their best individual and collective interests. A different normative system must be internalized by individuals and institutionalized as policy. This seems to me to be tantamount to a demand fundamentally to change human nature. It's also a case of explaining a very difficult concept by appealing to an even more problematic one. Corruption looks like a thick ethical concept. It combines normative and descriptive elements. It's difficult to see the, use, the, the word being used positively. Strong intellectual traditions and the idea of a natural standard encourage this, and Underkuffler is clearly responding to one set of such traditions, pre uh, predominantly the theological ones. Reacting against these wider, uh, more sweeping definitions of the term, the recent Supreme Court judgments in the states have stipulated that the core descriptive sense of corruption is simply quid pro quo. Um, and that's provoked uh, critics like Zephyr Treachout, uh, um, a superb name, uh, which is uh, the third book on uh, the, uh, the list, to appeal to expanded definitions. So she 
attacks the Supreme Court judgment, uh, quite rightly in some respects, but uh, in turn appeals to uh, an expanded definition that widened the scope of corruption and that challenged some of the deeper inequalities of wealth and power in modern America. Though, of course, doing so simultaneously embroils the concept in a set of debates about the intentions of the founding fathers, the nature of modern democracy, the proper ends of politics, and so on. Moreover, this kind of expansive academic debate has been matched, or paralleled at least, by the uptake of the term in popular discourse, uh, and often also in legislative and electoral politics. And the term is being used as a term of moral condemnation that accuses those in power of using their position to further partisan, factional, or personal ends. Um, uh, a 2015 Gallup poll in the United States found that 75% of respondents agreed that corruption is widespread throughout the government of this country. It's an extraordinary kind of uh, uh, finding. But actually similarly hostile judgments have been made of the governments of, in Western Europe and certainly in Central and Eastern European states which have struggled over the last 20 years with a corrosive culture of partisan accusation masquerading as moral, republic, moral repugnance uh, to cor the corruption of those in power. Such accusations encouraging, encourage sweeping demands to clean up politics that implicitly deny the inevitability of conflict, compromise, and dominance in the political order. Now, I take the precise and consistent identification of political, uh, cases of political corruption to be a fragile achievement that is worth preserving. There's no full set of necessary and sufficient conditions for the use of the term that both identify a discrete set of events and capture the full range of intuitions that accompany the term, but we can pick out criteria that capture roughly a core set of cases, even if any particular condition can also generate cases that provoke disagreement. Our definitions may not be imperfect, but more sweeping understandings of corruption derived from or uh, harnessing early modern the theological traditions or republican traditions that purport to offer more consistency seem wholly inapt as models of or expectations of the, the diverse and plural cultures of modern Western societies. Clearly, the ruling by the Supreme Court in Citizens United that corruption should be understood entirely in terms of bribery, and bribery wholly in terms of a financial incentive for a specific legislative quid pro quo, presses the term within such narrow confines that it can barely connect with the wider public understanding of the character of democratic politics. But we must, however, beware that contrary perspectives don't then open the term up for contestation in a way that proves destabilizing. The foregrounding of corruption in the public discourse of many Western states, especially in relation to non-Western states over the last 30 years, has made it harder to defend more restrained, rule-governed understandings of political corruption. Yet the inflation of moralizing rhetoric in politics tends to hamper decision-making, to hollow out trust in institutions, uh, and to hollow out trust in institutions. It's certainly not always wrong to raise uh, such questions, but these can often be done more directly. If, as in Treacher's case, you think practices should be more democratic, then by all means make that claim, rather than importing contestable normative conceptions of democracy into claims about what counts as corruption. Above all, we need to recognize that our political cultures rely on a range of compromises and settlements that can rarely stand exacting scrutiny on the grounds of absolute moral principles. And that's especially true in relation to political conduct. Political office stands in a very different relationship to impartiality than administrative office. In many political systems, politicians see themselves as appropriately self-regulating. They're elected to exercise their judgment, including judgment about what does or doesn't need regulation and about appropriate and inappropriate conduct in political office. Moreover, they need to do so while factoring in considerations such as how to enhance one's subsequent electoral prospects, how to raise campaign funds, how to present one's policies in more rather than less favorable lights, and so on. 
This means that elements that are integral to winning, keeping, and exercising office sit together in unstable and potentially conflicting mix with positional obligations, strategic political action, and prudential behavior. Moreover, political decisions are not impartial, and I think by definition cannot be. They are not necessarily self-interested, but as Bernard Williams put it, in them, somebody has lost. They are not impartial by definition if we see politics or political as opposed to administrative decisions as ruling in the favor of some values, ends or interests, and not in others. Underlying the exercise of political office then is some sense that in winning, one has the opportunity, perhaps a mandate, perhaps an obligation, to pursue some ends, values and goods, rather than others. Now, a great deal of political philosophy since 1960 has been directed to constructing normative bases for political orders. Rather little has addressed the character of political office and the nature of political rule. Um, but as Montaigne recognized, they demand uh, slightly different things from you. Uh, there you go. I'm not going to read it out, but you know, give you something to, to accompany the lecture. Uh, that it's clearly a, a kind of recognition uh, and a very early recognition that doing politics isn't exactly the same uh, as living in accordance with the rough rules that one develops as a schoolboy. Even meeting the formal requirements of political office is not a clear-cut requirement. For those in supreme ex executive office, formal requirements underdetermine action. They can be conflicting and in some cases they may jeopardize larger political responsibilities. It's not just that there's larger scope for discretion in political office, it's that judgment plays a major role in determining and interpreting what the responsibilities are. Similarly, political judgment has to take a consistently more consequentialist line on many issues, much more so than for those in administrative office. Even where there are some basic conventions, such as the responsibility to consult one's cabinet over certain decisions, with a divided and leaky cabinet, with low levels of trust, with a level of urgency and political sensitivity to the issue, it's often better just to do so retrospectively. It's not a, and, and actually it's widely accepted that that's the case. Now most Western states have developed distinctions between formal and political dimensions of political office. The formal is what the office requires according to statute, formal procedural requirements, uh, institutional conventions. The political refers to how people interpret the powers, responsibilities, and purposes designated by their formal position. The processes by which policies are chosen and pursued, and the means that they're prepared to endorse to secure the desired outcome. Most legislatures have bodies, sometimes independent of them, more often not, that conduct disciplinary proceedings against members who violate the formal rules of parliament, but members of legislatures are also held to account politically at elections through legislative questions and debate and through public scrutiny. Public commentary on politicians and reactions to the conduct of politicians frequently obscures the difference between those formal uh, uh, components of office and matters of political judgment and between formal and political accountability. And politicians sometimes get these things badly mixed up. Resolving consequentialist considerations in ways that ride roughshod over public trust, for example, Nixon in Watergate, or setting aside careful evaluation of consequentialist considerations in favor of absolute principle or moral commitment. One thinks a bit of Blair in Iraq. Indeed, the two dimensions frequently pull in different directions. Few want unprincipled consequentialists, nor do they want moralists who stick to their values irrespective of the costs they impose. We probably want politicians to be decent people and to be politically savvy and effective so as to survive in the political struggle. But the conditions of modern politics, certainly in adversarial political systems um, that are relatively open to public scrutiny, make it difficult to sustain the illusion that these are wholly compatible requirements. 
and the expectations and the language that most ordinary people bring to the evaluation of political office and that commentators, the media and rival politicians often encourage them to bring generally looks for virtue, integrity, a judgment of a more or less uncompromised form. Yet the job that politicians have to do and the challenges that they have to negotiate often work against such uncompromising commitments. The result is an instability at the heart of public evaluation of those in politics. Um, so the, the problems that politicians face, I'm really not pleading for them, but that they do face, are exacerbated by destructive spirals of decaying public trust. When trust declines, people demand increased scrutiny. With regulation, surveillance, accountability mechanisms functioning as a, as a, as a substitute for the perceived lack of integrity. But increased scrutiny of political office can make responsible decision making in highly charged contexts substantially more difficult. Politicians need room in which outcomes, probabilities and policy can be explored and compromises hammered out without immediate exposure to the public gaze. Finding an agreement that will stick and that people can commit to often requires the precise character of the bargaining to be shielded from wider scrutiny or publicity. So people have been distressed by some of the deals that were struck in the peace process in Northern Ireland. And there must be a question about whether the extent of the concessions made in certain cases was necessary to conclude that process. But it's worth reflecting on how that question might be answered. If those involved judge them to be necessary, then we have to make, take it as a matter of political judgment that the war, ending the war, justified making those particular deals. Our ex post judgment might be different, and we might punish people politically for the decisions they took. But unless we can prove that they were struck for illicit gain, there's no formal grounds for doing so. Of course, politicians will be reticent about exactly what was on the table. They prefer to celebrate the deals they've struck rather than the ones they failed to achieve. Yet invoking something like freedom of information to reveal all would have a huge effect on what ministers would be prepared to do and would also have a huge effect on uh, whether or not they could attain a deal in the first place because of what would then become uh, apparent. Negotiation and compromise are essential elements of politics but they can become much more difficult the more people know in advance the options and the commitments that people have made, since that knowledge makes it costly for politicians to change their minds or may, may make them seem to be resiling from expressed commitments. Because other people in the political world uh, with different interests know this, they often leak information to make it more difficult for a government or a party or a minister to adopt a particular course or to change it. Furthermore, the more hostile you see your environment as being, the more cagey you're likely to be, and that can become a seriously destructive spiral, generating an increasingly vigilant press, increasingly paranoid behind closed doors decisions, active spinning and briefings against one's opponents, and a sharp decline in political responsibility. I say all this uh, knowing that the next two years is going to be an absolute um, dog's dinner in terms of negotiation over a certain mistake that the British public have made. Uh, but it is very difficult to see how anything good is going to come from that process insofar as it's open to wider public scrutiny because what it will mean in the UK is that the Prime Minister will be besieged by Brexit Tories who will want to press the hardest possible kind of line. Uh, the idea that you could leave this to the civil service to sort out um, uh, is, I think, not an option that's going to be available. And yet that is likely to produce, would be likely to produce a much better process uh, than anything that will now take place. So modern democratic politics, as I've just suggested, dominated as it is by the news media, adds additional complexity. 
Politicians know that they need the media to convey their policies and to conduct their political fight with opposing parties, but that also exposes them to a range and depth of potential scrutiny that can be highly intolerant to the rough and tumble of political decision making, the necessities of political compromise, the non-linear process of forming policy. So thus far, the account I've given identifies a number of tensions that affect many modern, lib largely liberal democratic states. Um, uh, how should we understand claims about political corruption in such states? How do we, should we see it in terms of the corruption of rather than by politics? Most Western political systems claim, most systems claim to authority and legitimacy are conditional on a range of procedures, practices, rights, privileges, and so on, rooted in historical, institutional, conventional rules, norms, and practices. We operate within political systems, that is, within rules and requirements that distinguish appropriate and inappropriate conduct, probity, and corruption, albeit in precise um, and detailed and hard to generalize ways. Sticking to these intra-system elements uh, renders claims about corruption a much more determinate and more local phenomenon. And although these more local claims may lack some of the moral weight that accusations of corrupt corruption often presume, um, the core of claims about corruption becomes a matter of consistency uh, uh, between conduct and the prescribed norms and rules of office. It's clear that such local readings of corruption often don't satisfy people. They lack the weight of corruption, of evil, of subversion, and so on. Bled of the demands and expectations generated by the claim to high moral ground, the accusation of political corruption comes down to saying that X has broken the rules in a certain manner, with a certain intent and motive, and in ways that subvert aspects of the public duty although we can identify broadly more or less egregious forms uh, or cases of this. But this disjunction between the popular and the internal standards is one that politics has to address and that I think political theory has to address. It's not an argument for taking up the populist denunciation. On the account I've sketched here, our understanding of public office in the West involves a range of components that give a precise set of meanings to office and to the corruption of that office. They're largely built around a conception of office that dominates the occupant's interests, but the exact set of expectations, the lines drawn in relation to motives, the degree of trust reposed in such offices varies considerably, being deeply affected by the history, traditions, and understandings that have grown up around modern institutions in different states. There's a variability within and between different cultures which have forged sets of rules and expectations that responded to the particular contexts and conflicts that they faced, producing an order that could sustain, for the most part, broad legitimacy. Modern democratic societies often press local understandings in more ideal directions and have developed much more demanding conceptions of office exacerbated by the fact that Western states have then decided to take up the cudgels of corruption and tell the rest of the world how to run their societies. The degree to which this is cause for concern depends on the extent to which these claims begin to eat away at the legitimacy accorded to and the trust reposed in those in public office. But it's important to recognize that these more sweeping claims are not themselves neutral in any way. They are not a crusade above the fray. They are intrinsically political, and they often deny that. If we recognize their political character and recognize the fragility of political legitimacy and open democratic cultures, we need to provide constructive responses and reforms within the procedures and institutions of the polity and a more restrained and precise evaluative language. There are, of course, states whose political orders are insouciant to their citizens, unconcerned to rule by procedure and impartial practice, interested in more systematically exploiting their domination over their subjects. Nothing I've said denies this. As Williams suggests, liberalism 
is a language uniquely suited to the basic legitimation demand in advanced Western states. It can't function for states with different historical and cultural legacies. And we need to address the huge practical problems of articulating and constructing more robust traditions of political and public office in these other states that currently identify political power as simply an opportunity for redistributional and self-enrichment gains. But in doing so, we can't assume that we can simply transfer our world to them and we ought to be sure that we understand our own political orders and their particularities and vulnerabilities first. So Western politicians clearly can be corrupt and many political systems betray strong currents of ethical drift. Much in politics tests people, people's conduct and their judgment, both for those in power and for those around them. The result is an unstable mix. The tendency of those in political office to drift and hubris, the tendency amongst the electorate to confuse personal and political qualities and dimensions of accountability, and a more general waning of trust in those in power that demands ever higher levels of accountability and transparency. Hence the need for more intelligent forms of accountability which need to accord politicians the space to deliberate on options and the time to formulate responses to problems, recognizing that they may need to change their minds in the light of evidence or to respond to political exigencies that make the securable, securable compromise something that falls short of the initial ambition but is nonetheless worth having. We can ask whether they got as good a deal as they could have got but that is largely a matter of political accountability and one where rules, political rules of engagement apply. That means that politicians can't be expected to be wholly open and candid about what they tried to achieve, what obstacles they faced, what compromises they had to make. There are formal questions about whether and to what extent they acted in keeping with the duties they have as an office holder. And where that is an issue, other forms of inquiry may be necessary. But these need asking principally by the right bodies. Crucially, media questioning, in virtue of opening the politician to public scrutiny, will inevitably be treated as political in character and responded to as such. That is, without any sense of an obligation of complete candor. That is why media inquiry about formal behavior raises questions uh, in a very kind of fraught ground. Um, and it, since it's being asked in a political are arena, uh, that immediately uh, colors it. On this account, there's not much scope for transforming our political cultures or for dramatically increasing personal integrity amongst politicians. And such aspirations are troubling at many levels. So too is the view that moral ideals and principles provide an absolute constraint on political conduct. One reason we have politics, that we have politi political procedures and institutions, is precisely to resolve authoritatively conflicts over the limits to which some people's moral convictions can be allowed to dominate other people's convictions or preferences. Politics and decision and law is the process through which such clashes are settled. And any claim to high moral ground has only the standing that it can win in that political process. Bidding for public support for a view, however moral, is a political act. And as such, it competes with others in a political arena and has no special status. Much of the time, actors in the political public domain perhaps especially journalists, seek to persuade us that things are other than this. But that, too, is politics. As Montesquieu commented, though I've slightly amended the quotation, um, in absolute monarchies, journalists betray the truth because they do not have the liberty to tell it. In extremely free states, they betray the truth because of their very liberty. For as it always produces divisions, each one becomes as much the slave of the prejudices of his faction as he would be of a despot. The amendment was that he said historians, not journalists. This is not to say that politics is undifferentiated. 
one of the achievements of many Western political systems is the development precisely of procedures, institutions, practices that can secure compliance and that have come increasingly to frame and delimit areas of distinctively political activity. We protect those institutions and practices through a variety of formal institutions and offices. And in doing so, we distinguish various types and processes of accountability. Political contestation and self-seeking is then, to some degree, contained. But the lines are fragile. That makes, it, that makes it crucial that we support the formal elements of the system and don't blur them. If we re recognize legitimation as the ether in which political systems live and operate, and if we acknowledge that such legitimation cannot fully rest on rationality or impartiality, then we should be addressing the question of how to sustain a public or civic culture and a political discourse that respects and supports those distinctions and, institution, and the institutions that police them. What I hope to have conveyed is that it's not an easy thing to achieve or to sustain, and that many of the central participants, whether politicians or journalists, often mismanage some of the crucial issues about what is procedural and what political, and have incentives to overreach and overstate their claims in ways that can threaten the integrity of the system. I've also tried to suggest that a sociologically, historically, and institutionally informed process of political reflection might usefully address more directed and local questions about what needs sustaining and what should be questioned in the mix of forces that secure the legitimacy of particular political orders. So let me just say a final word about Plato. In the Gorgias, when Socrates uh, uh, demonstrates that Gorgias, Gorgias and his colleagues hold contradictory or implausible beliefs, he weakens the support of the crowd for them. But he comes empty-handed. He represents an innocent abroad, outwitting those who claim the political as their territory, while denying that he has any knowledge of that territory. But the state of aporia, or uncertainty that he manages to generate, is not a stable state. Decisions must be taken, laws made, order sustained, security maintained. In doing so, some interests, values, and ends are served to a greater extent than others. The challenge is not to establish impartial decision-making or reasonableness or complete rationality, but to establish systems and procedures that ensure that, to a greater or lesser extent, within the bounds of realistic possibility, those subject to the outcomes of decisions can mostly acknowledge them as having some degree of legitimacy, perhaps that losers don't lose too badly, that compliance relies only lightly on coercion, that winners show some moderation, and that those who exercise power do more so for collective than sectional ends, all things that are being sacrificed in the Brexit process. Understood as part of the terminology of politics, rather than as appealing to a set of ideal standards outside it, the claim that the political process can be corrupted can support that legitimacy. But it can also come to challenge it. Much rests on how it's deployed. In the case of public office, the precise definition of the offense of political corruption and the indictment of individuals for specific infringements of rules is much less corrosive of the political order than blanket claims that dispute the system's legitimacy of the system as a whole or attack its political class. This means that attention to corruption requires dull, careful work from political theorists and scientists. Uh, and actually, most political theorists, I think it's fair to say, have responded to the attractions of following their preferred normative thrust for the concept rather than sticking to its more descript strict descriptive content within a determinate political system. But that more inflated rhetoric of political corruption takes no hostages. The accused of fallen men and women, self-seeking, corrupt in character, evil beyond redemption. That rhetoric can call on deep-seated traditions of theological and republican thought that have little time for the niceties of political context and the complexities of motivation. But in plural, somewhat liberal and somewhat democratic societies, 
whose achievement has been to build civic and political systems that tolerate a range of value commitments and protect individuals from the moral crusades of their fellow, fellow citizens, this kind of rhetoric can dramatically weaken the legitimacy of the political order and increase its stability. There is corruption in politics, but the political and politics is not itself intrinsically corrupt. And there is some responsibility for our political theory and political science to recognize that. In doing so, if I may finally bow to Max Weber, we have to accept political theory is as subject, is as subject to the ethic of responsibility as are those in politics, because it too is political and that it too must accept the need for the slow boring of hard boards. Thank you very much.